I'm Brandi Cruz. Coming up today on Undivided, the homeless industrial complex is getting very, very worried about Andrea Suarez and We Heart Seattle. Plus, a judge gives shockingly low bail to a teen driver who killed four people. And Governor Jay Inslee touts his time in office as a period of great progress for the state of Washington. Suffice it to say, I disagree. That and more coming up today on Undivided. Remember, you can support our show for just five bucks a month by signing up at UndividedPod.com. And welcome to Undivided. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your commitment to giving common sense a comeback. I'm Brandi Cruz. If there's one thing I've learned doing this job, a job where we, look, we give as good as we get. We get as good as we give. We give as good as we get. Yeah, I get criticized all the time. I criticize people in return. That's part of the job in the public sphere when you're trying to make a difference, when you're trying to influence policy, when you're trying to improve the state that you love. Yeah, there are going to be some people who are so beholden to the way that things have always been done that when you start to be effective, you start to be attacked. And one of the things I've learned is you have to stand by your friends in this business and in this realm. And I will tell you that if my friends are at war against insanity, then I'll stand side by side with them. And last night, that's one of the reasons I posted a picture of Nicole and I with Andrea Suarez of We Heart Seattle. Because I don't know if you heard, but Andrea Suarez is being subjected to a renewed line of attack about the work she's done with We Heart. So I posted a picture without much context about what I was going to discuss today. And I, don't, I think I said, watch out, Seattle. Common sense is coming for you. Yes. Yes. And, and I just happen to also think that's a very good picture of us. I know. A very fine picture. Although some lady on the internet oh. called us fat. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> no, she said we're bigger than she thought. Bigger? What do you mean bigger? Taller? I bigger so. brains? <laughs> what, is, what is it? What is it? Anyway, I'm, I'm off track. People but are I, very bold online. Very bold online behind their keyboards. Mm -hmm. Um... So anyway, I saw yesterday online that Andrea Suarez was being subjected to renewed attacks for the work that she's doing with We Heart Seattle. So I wanted Andrea to know, I got your back and I will go to battle with you and I'll stand side by side with you proudly because I believe in the work that she's doing. And I believe, look, Andrea is a wild lady. She is. We've had her on the show. We've met her in person. She is a unique kind of human being. And you have to be to go from being a private citizen to deciding one day that you're sick and tired of looking at the trash in the beautiful parks in the city where you live and that you're going to go start to freaking clean it up because the city's not doing it. That takes a special kind of person. And she is certainly outside uh, of the Seattle bubble of homeless industrial complex where they have a certain way of doing things. She's unorthodox. But you know what? Orthodox isn't working. And because Andrea is effective and because she has built this entire ecosystem, again, starting with herself just cleaning up trash in homeless encampments, that's how this started. Let's not forget that. This didn't start with some, you know, lady getting rich off of going out and cleaning up trash at encampments because what she was, you know, it was lucrative for her. It was fun for her. It was enjoyable. It was none of the above. It is none of the above. So this started with just a private citizen going out and cleaning up trash because no one else was freaking doing it. And she was watching the city around her go to hell. And, and she has started a movement from it. They have thousands of volunteers who go out. We have gone out. Some of you have gone out to clean up trash in city right-of-ways that has been festering there for decades. Andrea goes out there. She cuts through the government bureaucracy and red tape. And she gets people connected to services. She does more on her little island than we've seen the homeless industrial complex for all of its billions of dollars in taxpayer money that's been wasted. She does more than they could ever hope to do. And that's why the homeless industrial complex hates her so much. And that is why stop the sweep activists who live and breathe to see these homeless people stay in place to see them die with a needle in their arm, 
to see them raped in the tents, to see them victimized while living on the streets. That's why those far left fringe activists who want to leave these homeless people in place hate Andrea Suarez so much. Why they go to such great lengths to attack her character and her work because they don't want people off the streets. You have to realize that. You have to understand that. They do not want people off the streets. If the homeless industrial complex wanted people off the streets, we wouldn't have a homeless crisis because they get billions of dollars. There's thousands of people who work for the government within that institution at the city level, at the county level, at the state level. And we have a worse homeless crisis than we've ever had. If they wanted to fix it, they could, but they don't. They want to keep those big bloated government uh, paychecks and salaries and, and checks for contract work coming in. So that's that. And then you look at the activists. And again, like I said, everything they do, everything they say, without a shadow of a doubt, is designed to keep people living in squalor and filth and death and addiction. They want to go out and harm reduction. Oh, get these people... Uh, the, the needles they need and everything they need to be able to continue to use the drugs that are killing them. They go out and protest sweeps because they'd rather have someone living in squalor and die in their tent than they would, oh, have some sort of, oh, interaction with law enforcement. And I, I for the life of me, don't really know what is motivating the far left activists to want to so badly keep people living in filth. I cannot wrap my mind around it. So anyway, those are the people who are attacking Andrea Suarez and We Heart Seattle and have since We Heart's inception. They can't stand that she's doing what she's doing outside of the system because it hurts their bottom line, right? Well, if Andrea can do this for a fraction of the cost with volunteers, what does that mean for our multi-million dollar lucrative contract with the city or the county or the state? It's all about money. It's not about lives. It's not about homeless people. Give me a freaking break. Now, what disappoints me is when the media plays that game. I've said before, you know, people are like, you're so critical of Democrats. Oh, you must be a Republican, all of this. I'm critical of Democrats because Democrats are in power. And I believe it is the fundamental job of the media to hold the powerful accountable. And so in this state, if you're seeking to do that, that is the Democrats, that is the progressives. And in this state, if you're a member of the media and you have all this power and this influence to ask people in power difficult questions, to hold them accountable for what they do or what they don't do, and if you're covering the homeless crisis, where are you going to put your power and your energy as a member of the media? Would you not put it at the government? Would you not spend that time and that energy and your reporting and your power directed at an ecosystem that spends billions of dollars in taxpayer money to only make things worse? You certainly wouldn't spend it criticizing Andrea Suarez and her team of volunteers that operates off of donations and out of the good of their heart is out there helping people. Because in the grand scheme of things, Andrea is just a speck in the whole industrial complex. And she's not using taxpayer funds. So I was disappointed to see that my friends over at Cairo Radio spent this a lot of airtime and a lot of energy on a series of stories attacking Andrea Suarez and We Heart Seattle. Now, look, I'll just caveat this with I love my friends at Cairo Radio. I started my career there. Nicole and I both worked there. That's how we met. I have a lot of, I mean, how do I put this? I still have a lot of friends that work there. So I'm, I'm not quick to criticize them, but I criticize all the media, and so they're fair game as well. And I will say, so they put out this series, a uh, video series, and it looked at the work Andrea Suarez and We Heart Seattle is doing, and then it dove into the controversy around her, which I believe is completely manufactured by the far left because they cannot stand that she's working outside the system and having more success. So it does, it, I think it was a four-part series, is that right, Nicole? Four, three, four, five, I don't know. Um, from Cairo Radio, the first one's about Andrea Suarez and the work that they're doing. And then the second one dives right into what people say about her on the internet. Here is a clip. 
Search engine results for the nonprofit's name lead to countless accusations across multiple social media platforms. The posts accuse We Heart Seattle of lying to people living in the camps about who they are and not getting permission from people before throwing their belongings away. The scathing entries come from critics as well as those purporting to be close to homeless people We Heart Seattle has interacted with. An entire website is dedicated to documenting alleged misdeeds of the organization. So when I hear that, I'm like, so a bunch of random internet trolls, basically. And, and that's what the critique of Andrea is. It comes from these far left internet trolls who post anonymously, many of them, who have a website. Oh, Andrea is throwing away homeless people's belongings. Andrea is doing this. Andrea is doing that. And again, ask yourself the question as we go through this. Why would people be so committed to attacking a woman who decided one day to go clean up trash in her neighborhood? Ask yourself that question. So the, the whole crux of, of the attacks on her are based on online smears, which I think are completely ridiculous and, and manufactured. But then this Cairo Radio report actually speaks to and highlights the voices of some of the far left fringe activists the stop the sweeps crowd who just don't like what Andrea is doing. One of them, her name is Alicia Ramirez, and she's just sort of your run of the mill internet troll. I think she's a, I think she works at a QFC in Kirkland. So she's not in the homeless, uh, the, the homeless realm. She's just a random activist who calls herself an anarchist on Twitter. Like she's just a random person on the internet who Cairo Radio decides to elevate as this voice to criticize Andrea Suarez for not having the proper training to go about this kind of work. When like Reach and Lead will go out and do um, like actual, when they'll go out and do outreach, um, these are trained social workers that are also, you know, that are, they're also coming along. So they have the training and, and knowledge to make that harm less impactful, if that makes sense. No, it doesn't, because how has that worked? So you're sitting there saying, oh, reach and lead these government contractors and entities. They're trained in this. They can go out and they're social workers. And how has that worked, Alicia? How has that gone? These trained social workers going out there, being paid by the taxpayers. How has that gone? Not well. Not well for the homeless people living on the streets. Not well for the city, not well at all, by any measure. So they might have a social worker degree or a license, but it is clear that what they're doing is not effective. I would also say one of the things noted in this story is that Andrea Suarez has found several dead people while she's been out clearing these encampments. In fact, one of the... Um, encampment clearings that was done on city property. Andrea found a body that had been there for so long, it was just bones. And Cairo Radio and the reporter Sam Campbell acknowledges that in this piece. Despite the accusations and doubt cast on the organization's ethics, We Heart Seattle and its volunteers were the ones to find the person's remains near Dexter Avenue. It's city land, and yet city crews had not found the person's corpse long enough for it to decompose down to the bone. Yeah, so tell me again why we should be leaving this up to city contractors. The city contractors that Alicia Ramirez, the anarchist activist, says, oh, they're trained to do this kind of stuff. Well, obviously they're not trained well enough to spot a body that's decomposing down to the bones on city property. Apparently they hadn't been out there doing their trained, certified, city-approved outreach in quite a while. So Andrea and her team go out and do it, no strings attached to the city, no social worker degree or whatever you need. But they were able to find these remains and give closure to a family because they care enough to go in and do the difficult work. You know, license taxpayer funds be damned. Now let's listen to uh, another of the far left fringe activists whose voices are inexplicably being elevated in an effort to smear and criticize the work of a volunteer. I, I know outreach workers um, have to sp spend a lot of, of effort in some cases, like 
demonstrating that 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 they're they're sincere. It, it, it's it's a real issue. Uh, I just you know, yeah, it's it's creating more more barriers. Oh, creating more barriers. That's um, that's Aiden Carroll, an activist who again is reiterating look you know andrea is not trained in all of this and she has to go out and spend time convincing people that she's trustworthy and that her tactics are are sound and i was listening to that and i thought aiden carroll that sounds awful familiar and then i remembered that just last month aiden carroll was among the six people who were arrested at seattle city hall for their threatening and harassing behavior of the council members in fact, Aiden Carroll wasn't only one of the ones who were arrested and trespassed out of City Hall, but Aiden Carroll was also accused of obstructing law enforcement. And this is not his first rodeo. In fact, we had found a bio for him online for UW when he was a student there that talked about how on his free time he enjoys agitating. Agitating for change. Is that him agitating for change? Him and his group slamming on the glass outside the Seattle City Council chambers because the, they would not listen to them about giving free housing to asylum seekers. So here we are elevating the voice of dangerous activists who aren't doing anything to help the people on the street. People who, I'm sorry to say it like this, aren't, aren't anyone important in that sphere. Again, a, a grocery store worker in Kirkland, like that's fine, uh, nothing against grocery store workers, but why are you qualified to be lifted up on the news as some expert voice to criticize a woman who is doing more than you ever even thought of doing for the city of Seattle? And then you're elevating the voice of a fringe activist who's been arrested on numerous occasions for his tactics, but you're gonna lift him up so he can question the tactics? of Andrea Suarez, whose only goal is to go out there and clean up the city and help people? What in the world is this? This is wild, wild stuff. And this is exactly how Seattle got into this position, is giving crazy fringe lunatics a voice. As if their voice should be held on equal footing to the voice of people like Andrea who are actually out there doing the difficult work. You're talking about keyboard warriors, far left fringe activists, who go and throw a fit and throw a tantrum when they don't get their way. Why do they need a voice on the news? It's wild to me. Uh, and here's Andrea. For those who are watching, she has a very nice hat on in this story, which I appreciate. Uh, but here's Andrea talking about the criticism that she's not a social worker. When you're doing those welfare checks, do you have caseworkers here with you? We are caseworkers. Tim and I are caseworkers. We've been doing this for three and a half years. We've been through trauma-informed care training, de-escalation training, on-the-job training. My educators are the 200 people and the thousands of homeless that we've met right here on the slopes that have said, you guys are game changers. But in terms of like, you know, uh, state or city license for caseworking? I don't know. Did Jesus Christ have a license? I love that so much. Like, literally, do you need to have a license to go out and ask people if they want help? Is that what our contention is? That doesn't seem very progressive or empathetic to me. You're saying, oh, you have to have a social working license to go out and ask people if they need help and connect them to that help. You have to have a social worker's license to go clean up the city that you love. Is that really where we've come? Is that really where we're using our power and our influence as members of the media in this entire ecosystem of the homeless industrial complex? Let's focus on the woman who's operating off of volunteer funds and volunteer hours and who's out there getting her hands dirty, doing the work, working like 20 hours a day. Let's focus our energy on criticizing her and criticizing her using the voices of far left fringe activists who have never helped a homeless person a day in their freaking lives. And let's ignore the big elephant in the room the failed homeless industrial complex that is taking billions of dollars from all of us hardworking people and squandering it. Let's focus on Andrea instead. Give me a freaking break. I will go to war for Andrea, just like I will go to war alongside anyone who stands for sanity in an insane world. And I will not use an ounce an ounce of my influence, of my time, criticizing people like Andrea 
who are just trying to make a positive difference where the government is failing. Absurd. My hand hurts. Sorry. <laughs> Nicole's like, oh, wait, you're just hitting things over here today. Wow. I'm mad. I don't like when people go after my friends. I know. And again, I'm more at it, mad at the, look, Cairo Radio, I love you. I love you, my friends. This was a miss. This was a big old fat miss. And honestly, a misuse of your power and influence and, and platform. So look, it, it doesn't mean Andrea is completely above criticism, but the, the timing of this is highly, highly suspicious to me. Andrea and I, we were just at this Seattle Police Foundation event and Andrea was there and we were talking to her and she's finally starting to make inroads with the city mm -hmm. and with city leaders. And they're finally starting to understand that she's a part of the solution, that they should be excited to have her working, something the old guard at Seattle City Hall didn't, didn't get, didn't grasp. Why would we not welcome this woman with open arms and, and learn from her and see what we can do together? So just as she's starting to make those inroads and that progress, the criticism, the old criticism from years ago starts to bubble back up and it's back in the media and it's being talked about. It's because she's effective and they can't have effective. They can't have effective. And we see this too. There's a couple stories coming out about yours truly that I know are going to be hit pieces. And you know what I'm going to chalk that up to? Because we're effective. So when people are attacking you, you're over the target. All right, an update on this 18-year-old driver in Renton who was going more than 100 miles an hour, smashed into a vehicle, and killed four people, including three children. So he had his bail hearing, and he's still in the hospital. And I give Jeremy Harris over at Como a lot of credit. As critical as I am as, of the media, I always want to make sure that I point out the people who are doing a good job. Jeremy Harris, I'm a big fan. Big fan. I think you're doing great over at Como. So he uh, covered the bail hearing, which was an emotional one. You had the parents of, of uh, the kids who were killed, who spoke, trying to convince this judge to give um, this 18-year-old this, uh, suspect a high bail. It is the moment that has changed families forever. It's what prosecutors allege 112 miles per hour looks like. It's so fast you barely see Chase Jones's vehicle come from the right side of your screen and plow right into a van full of children. I'm a little concerned and shocked that there has been no, to my knowledge, no attempt to reach out to us or the Browns or Hudsons with any kind of message of of sympathy or regret. Jones's attorney told the court he's not stealing cars, having a gun, or intentionally trying to commit a violent crime. This is an allegation in which my client may have made a dumb mistake in driving um, uh, up above the speed limit. That's the allegation. Um, I don't think that this was just a dumb mistake. How? I mean, the, the tone deafness is insane. A dumb mistake. And then for the, the defense attorney to argue, oh, he's not out there stealing cars, doing guns, intentionally hurting anyone. You were going, what was it, 107 miles an hour, 112 miles an hour in, on a city street. And, and the video there was insane, where it's like a you can't even see him. He's going so fast. And just like that, four lives snuffed out. So to illustrate it, I don't know. I've seen some dumb arguments from defense attorneys in my day covering crime and justice. But especially having the parents of the kids who were killed there saying, oh, he made a dumb mistake. He just went over the speed limit. No, he went shockingly over the speed limit on a city street and had a history of it. And that's one of the key things. You know, there have been, I think it was in Kent, his last one, where he, he's totaled, remember, this is the kid who's totaled two other cars this year. Two other cars in the course, in less than a year. And then kept getting new ones and then totaled this one too. And the last time he got a stern warning from Kent PD, there's body camera video where he acknowledges he was going like twice the speed limit. So this is a guy who has, this is a kid, this is a, an adult, a young adult who has never been taught that there are consequences for his actions. So anyway, I think one of the things that I can't say I'm shocked by anything anymore, but I really thought that the bail would be high because again, going back to that, a judge has to consider danger to the community. And I understand that this 18 year old Chase Jones, he's still laid up in the hospital, unclear when he's gonna get out. So for the time being, I guess the community is safe from him while he's hospitalized. But again, when you look at setting bail, you're determining a variety of factors, the severity of the crime, and also the likelihood to reoffend. 
If this person gets out, do they pose a danger to the community? Well, this is a guy who's already totaled three vehicles, didn't learn his lesson the first two times. The third time, he killed four people. I would argue he presents a clear and present risk to the public if he's let out. But Jeremy Harris uh, over at Como said the judge, um, well, first acknowledged Judge Joanna Bender says Jones's speeds were at a level for a NASCAR track and says Jones has a pattern of impulsive behavior citing his prior speed-related crashes. So the judge understood all that. The judge was fully aware of the severity of what he's accused of doing and also of his propensity to do these sorts of things. But then prosecutors had asked for a million dollars bail. The judge said it at 100000 Jeremy Harris says Judge Bender sets bail at 100000 down from a million. She gave a thorough explanation of why, including, she said, if he bails out, she sets conditions of no access to vehicles or, quote, anything else with wheels and will require GPS monitoring. Uh, and then Jeremy notes there's no uh, estimate as to when he'll be released from the hospital. I've got to say, though, just this this 18 year old sitting there, I did not. I saw like an emotionless face, completely like stoic and emotionless, which was shocking to me, given what he did. But one hundred thousand dollars, that's ten thousand dollars on bond. That's all he has to give up as collateral. I mean, he's got to prove, you know, family that you've got a collateral, $100,000. You know, anyone who has a house has $100,000 in collateral. Well, he's also which, had three very nice new cars yes. in the last couple of years. So I imagine that mommy and daddy, who were called, who he called to the scene of his other two incidents before police got there, imagine that they're going to have no issue putting up $100,000 collateral and then in $10,000 to get him out. And then he gets to be home on, on GPS monitoring and, oh, you can't have access to anything with wheels. That's good. Will he abide by it? I don't know. It's just another example of even in the worst of the worst scenarios. I mean, he's facing four counts of vehicular homicide. Even in the worst of the worst scenarios, we have jurists who just want to take it easy on, on young people. And that is the opposite of the message that we need to be sending during a juvenile crime crisis. Just wild. $100,000 bail. Wrap your mind around that one. Okay, coming up next, King County's warning of a public health collapse if they don't get more money. I love the fear mongering just to squeeze every possible penny out of you that they can. We'll discuss. First, I've talked about my success on the Eastside Weight Loss Clinic program, even though the lady on Twitter called me fat. My, I don't know. Was she talking to me, you, so Andrea? Bigger. Bigger. Not fat. Bigger than I expected. <laughs> Listen, I've got all the right curves in all the right places, lady. <laughs> and your picture was of like a tomato. So I want to see what you really look like. <laughs> I think if I think that's what her <laughs> avatar was. It was like, you know, it's always the ones with like the cat picture or the mm -hmm. the avatar of, of of a bird and they're like, "You're ugly." And I'm like, "Well, what do you even look like?" Internet troll. <laughs> Isn't it funny? There's lots of compliments. We always focus on the negative. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I'm a girl, okay? I'm just a sensitive woman. And, you know, I just play a hard ass on my podcast. <laughs> and my feelings do get hurt. Anyway, uh, what was I doing? Oh, EastSideClinic.com. <laughs> I look damn good, okay? I worked hard for this. Uh, anyway, I've heard, I'm going to cry, not about a sadness, <laughs> out of laughter. I've heard a lot of success stories from you guys, and I, I love it. And one of the things I made a point of uh, saying on the show last week, I think, so we're in April, April, May. Two months is all you need to have substantial results on the Eastside Weight Loss Clinic program. I lost 30 pounds in, in just two months. I'm down almost 40 pounds total. So if you're thinking, gosh, I could you know, cut a little weight, feel better, look better before summer, like start now. I'm telling you, it's not magic. You do have to follow the program in order to see those kinds of results, but the results I got are not atypical. So man, you could be just looking and feeling your best by June. EastsideWeightLossClinic.com. I can't promise that even after you do that, somebody won't call you fat on Twitter. However, you can be looking substantially better for yourself, not for your Twitter haters. Schedule your free 15-minute consultation, EastsideWeightLossClinic.com. EastsideWeightLossClinic.com. Does anyone do better ad reads than me? <laughs> Um, no. Thank you. The answer is no. <laughs> you were going to say Dory, but <laughs> he was pretty good at them too. Anyway. I'll know how it's done. I'm all, the show's off the rails today. You know, the show's off the rails today. Uh, I want to talk about a few King County related stories. Remember Dow Constantine is like, oh, we're in such a dire financial situation. 
we're going to have to kill your firstborn children if we don't get any more <laughs> money. I mean, that's basically what it's chalked up to. And now they're trying to appeal to the bleeding heart progressives. Uh, here's the article from King 5. Most King County public health clinics could close in 2025 without a funding fix. The county faces a $35 million budget deficit as inflating costs outpace revenue. Leaders and healthcare workers are pushing for solutions. There's a couple key things in here I want to clue, clue in on. Uh, but again, citing the budget issues, Executive Constantine and King County Council members are searching for solutions as healthcare workers' unions launch a petition to raise awareness and seek action. There it is. S-E-I-U, S-E-I-U. They're worried about their money and their jobs and their government contracts. This has nothing to do with need or necessity. This has to do with the union and Democratic politicians making sure that their cronies are well fed. Uh, it goes on to say the public health Seattle King County clinics at risk offer primary care, maternal and children's health services, health care for people experiencing homelessness, and dental care for around 80,000 patients. And then it goes on. I'm not going to read the rest of it. So basically they're saying all Oh, give us more money. We have to have more money or else we're going to not be able to give this critical health care to people in our communities. Well, and of course, and look, it's the homeless and right. it's racist well, and yes. all of that. Advocates say more than 60% of patients identify as black, indigenous, or people of color. 40% speak a language other than English and a substantial population are uninsured or homeless. Wow. It almost seems as if maybe we should deal with the homeless crisis and then we hmm. wouldn't have to have this entire ecosystem of clinics and all this other money being spent on things to supplement the homeless crisis that we're in. Gosh, that seems like a, an interesting thing. Uh, King County Executive Constantine warned the community about the potential for these cuts in the fall of 2023. At the time, county leaders asked state lawmakers to consider several measures to give the county more flexibility in raising money. Lawmakers chose not to change a revenue growth limit that could have brought in some more funding, but it did pass two other bills that could help. One allows health clinics connected to Harborview Medical Center to get funding through a public hospital property tax. The other allows the county to put a levy to measure levy measure to voters to fund the uh, general fund programs that could otherwise be cut. So again, remember Dow Constantine came out in the fall and he was like, oh, the earth is ending. Give us more money. And he wanted lawmakers in Olympia to lift the property tax lid so they could increase your property taxes at a more aggressive rate without going to voters. Because remember, they could always do that. They'd have to ask you first. What he wanted is not to have to ask you. So he went to his buddies in Olympia and said, hey, can you pass this? But there was so much public pushback from common sense people that the lawmakers are like, I don't think we can do that this year. It's an election year. You know, we got Bob Ferguson. He's facing this real challenge. We just can't do that. So, yeah, now they're like, oh, we'll close the public health clinics. And remember, this is about SEIU. That's what the long-term care tax is about. It's about making sure that SEIU is getting all the money they could ever hope or dream of, but we're going to make sure that the long-term care program is absolutely done by making it optional in November on the ballot. Vote yes, pay less. Anyway, uh, one more King County story. So all this budget, budget deficit, all $35 million, which by the way, 35 million is nothing in the context of all the money we spend, especially in King County in the state. $35 million, they could cut their DEI programs and make up $35 million. In fact, I think we went through in the fall when he was asking, oh, I have a $35 million budget deficit. I think we went through and I found like a bunch of line items like cut, 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 done, $35 million. But they don't know how to budget. They want more and more and more and more services. They want to do more things. And they believe that the voters will just continue to give them more and more money. No, they need to budget like every other family does. But anyway, while that's happening, and then what does King County Executive Dow Constantine do? Oh, well, we need to find a way to help asylum seekers. Oh, we got all these, oh, can't have the clinics for, for citizens of Washington State and low income and all that, $35 million down. Oh, but now we've got asylum seekers and we absolutely need to take care of them. This from Como News, asylum seeking refugees forced to, fund, <laughs> forced to fundraise to extend Kent Hotel stay. Because remember, you had all these asylum seekers show up, as they have elsewhere around the country, and the government's like, oh, we'll put you up at a hotel. And now these asylum-seeking refugees and the nonprofits helping them, they're being forced <gasps> to fundraise, as opposed to continue to live off of the taxpayers of the United States. I mean, other people would call that work. 
for a living. Right. <laughs> like, oh, not only do you not want to work, but you're forced to fundraise. It says a group of 240 refugees on the brink of losing housing in the city of Kent. They've been trying to raise enough money to stay in their hotel until they can find stable shelter. I mean, first of all, who are we fooling anyone? All they're going to do is stay there anyway. And the hotel is going to have to like seek to evict them because that's what they're going to be told to do. It says the county is aware of the asylees currently at the Quality Inn in Kent, and we continue to work with partners and the state to determine how to allocate limited resources in the most impactful way as we address the issues across the region. That's from the King County Executive's Office. Uh, more county funding will be available this summer. On Friday, Governor Inslee signed his budget that includes $5 million for King County to respond to the refugee crisis. So again, not enough money to do all these things they say are vital to our communities and the people living here, but they will absolutely find the funds and find a way to make sure asylum seekers have a free place to stay. And by free place, I mean free for them, not for the taxpayers. Uh, and also we're waiting for a response from Dow's office on the uh, big fat check that was given to the squatter in Bellevue, $47,000 to pay off his back rent owed to uh, Jimmy, the landlord in Bellevue. So when we get that response, we'll bring it to you. They did promise, promise a this response by noon today. And as I sit here, it's 1237. Yeah. Not the first yet. time Dow Constantine's office has let me down. Probably not the last. Uh, but another disappointment nonetheless. But we will let you know. Coming up next in our segment, unbelievable. Another wrinkle in the saga of our state's failing juvenile detention uh, system. We're going to take you back down to, to Green Hill and to an interesting request that the Department of Children, Youth and Families gave our friend David Rose over at Fox 13. A request he said no to because he's the bomb. First, uh, if you've been thinking about selling your home at any point this year, it's important to get it ready to hit the market. I mean, the last thing you want to do is once the Fed drops interest rates, which will probably happen at some point in 2024, and then there's a rush to the market, and you're like, oh, I got to get my home on the market now because I'm going to get a better price for it. And then maybe you forgot, ah, I need some cosmetic upgrades and stuff so I get the best possible offer. Well, look, if you know you're going to sell your home in 2024, get it ready now. And that way, at the most advantageous moment to put it on the market, you can list it. So start by talking to our friend Wes Jones, at sellwithwest.com. Uh, we had him in recently and asked him, well, what's going to happen if the Fed just decides it's not going to drop interest rates this year? If they stay where they're at right now, I actually think that values will stay closer to where they're at. There will be, we'll see lower appreciation. We'll see appreciation, but it'll be modest. But if they start to come back down, well, that's when I think we'll start to see more of the multiple offer situations and the bid ups in home sale prices. Yeah, so you want to be ready to take advantage of the multiple offer situations of the bid ups. And that means if you need cosmetic up upgrades to your home or anything like that, you need to get an early start on it. So visit sellwithwest.com, sellwithwest.com. He's going to give you a free market analysis. You can use their home value calculator right there on the website to see how much your home might be worth. Uh, and also he can talk to you about their listing boost concierge service where they take everything off your plate. So you can just have a stress-free home selling experience. Sellwithwest.com, a better way to sell your home. All right, more chaos at Green Hill School, which is a juvenile detention facility uh, south of Olympia. And this has to do with um, requests for documents. And I think it's very, very telling. So in case you're not familiar with all the issues at Green Hill School that we've been covering, you have this juvenile detention facility where you've got kids up to the age of 25, which is insane. Um, and there's been all sorts of issues there. There has been drug trafficking. There's been attempts to bring in weapons. There have been attacks on guards. There have been guards accused of misconduct. So anyway, our friend uh, David Rose over at Fox 13, and I think Matthew Smith, and uh, this story's from Matthew Smith and Kate McDowell, uh, the headline Green Hill School security guard caught laughing after detectives say she facilitated attack on a teen. So you might recall that there was this, there's been a couple, you know, melees and stuff at Green Hill School, but there was a question about the extent to which guards might have been involved in either helping with those things or looking the other way. So this again from Fox 13, a state run facility long under scrutiny following a number of issues is now under the spotlight after a security guard is accused of not only allowing a fight to take place, but facilitating it. According to newly obtained investigatory, investigatory documents, Michelle Goodman was captured on camera laughing with inmates as they mimicked the punches thrown at a teenage inmate inside the Green Hill School, a youth detention facility in Lewis County. 
However, they are not keen to let the public see what has been taking place behind closed doors. In recent days, they've requested that Fox 13 remove public disclosure requests that would reveal video of major incidents that have taken place this year. It is rare for a state entity to request a journalism outlet to remove a request, especially in cases where the request was not directed to them. In this case, the videos in question belong to a third party. So this is shocking. And I gave David Rose credit because he was on the news. Is it his request or is it these reporters' requests? Uh, I think, well, David's the one that claimed after this piece on the news that I saw that I couldn't find yeah. for this uh, story. But he said, uh, we did not. Yeah. So I, I, maybe I gave... David credit for the request. It might have been another reporter's it's, request. But on the air, he was like, he was they, the one that claimed they no. asked us, yeah, they asked us to take our request back and we did not oblige, which I'm like, yes. thank you. And, and it's just wild. And one of the arguments was that, oh, protecting the people involved. Obviously, no one's being protected at Green Hill School. The kids aren't being protected. The staff aren't being protected. No, there's nothing safe about that environment already. And what the media, I think, has been doing, to their credit, a good job of is trying to expose some of the issues at Green Hill and some of the failures from the governor's office on down, the Department of Children, Youth and Families. We've had on law enforcement who have to respond to all these issues at Green Hill, who've talked about what a disaster it continues to be. So in the middle of all that, in the middle of this glaring spotlight, they're asking news agencies to take back their public disclosure requests. Yeah, no, thank you. I think I think that's a pretty good indication that you're on the right track. If you file a PDR and the agency's like, hey, can you not? <laughs> can you not request that information? Yeah, that's going to be a big old no. We're going to continue down this path. So I look forward to seeing what they get out of those documents. Because again, yeah, he you... said it, their deadline is, I believe, next week. So... Well, as we know, There's, public disclosure mm -hmm. deadlines come and go often They've without being fulfilled. They have had some issues with those. Okay, okay. Uh, we're going to get to some national. Did you have something else? Oh, well, you missed the unbelievable open. Did you <gasps> want to play it real quick? Because otherwise we'll hear about it. That has been unbelievable. <laughs> Boop. Beep. Are you happy now? All right, before we get to national news, including a new hate crime law out of Scotland that should have everyone terrified, has to do with gender identity, uh, I've encouraged you guys to take the First Mark Challenge. This is a great way, I think, to look and see if you can save a little money in your family's budget. So the First Mark Challenge is simple, and it costs you nothing, just a little bit of time. You go to First Mark, you schedule some time to talk to them about your current insurance and your insurance needs. Maybe you need uh, better insurance. Maybe you need to get a better price. Maybe you're looking for both, which isn't everyone. And what First Mark will do is it'll take that information, go out, shop their carriers for you and come back and say, hey, here's what we've got. And they'll either say, do you want to you know, work with us on your insurance needs? Or maybe what you have is already great. Uh, and I've heard so many good success stories. This one I loved. Uh, it's from one of our wonderful viewers, Eric in Woodenville. He said, I just wanted to say I took the first mark challenge. I'd been managing my own auto and homeowners policy for decades. I was of the school of thought that why do I need a middleman when I can work directly with the insurance companies myself? The people at first mark quickly showed me the error of my ways by saving me over 30% on my auto policy and a whopping 70% on my homeowners policy. I'm not exaggerating. I now tell anyone I know who's dealing with changes to their insurance to give first mark a call. I did it and I am literally Really richer for it. And I actually have a call with First Mark tomorrow because we're coming up on a year. And so they want to talk to you about, you know, how the insurance is going and your plan and whether there's any changes. So I'm going to have a nice little chat with a nice real person who's local. Isn't that amazing? Firstmarkinsurance.com, firstmarkinsurance.com. They work for you and you never pay them a dime. It truly is a no brainer. All right, dipping outside of Washington State, first down to San Francisco. So there's something in San Francisco called the BART system. If you're not familiar, it's just there. Metro. Metro system, right. And they ha it's had a lot of issues, which is not a surprise. Um, Seattle's public transportation and our um, sound transit and light rail has had a ton of issues related to crime. It's just not safe. And then take that times 100, and that's San Francisco, because their issues uh, are the same as what we're having in Seattle around drugs and crime and all of that. It's just on a grander scale because they've been dealing with it for a lot longer. But have no fear, because apparently they've found a surefire way to be able to keep people safe. And that is by giving out to young people something called a bystander intervention card. Here is a youth social media influencer to explain. Hello, excuse me, will we be able to have some bystander intervention cards, please? Uh, yeah, sure, hang on. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. So this card over here is for when you're being harassed. It says, you got me. So you'd hand it to somebody else and it gives them instructions on how they can help you. If you see someone being harassed, you can also give them this I got you card, which gives them instructions on the back to find the BART police or call someone or more instructions on how to be safe. I really appreciate these cards because they gave me a, a concrete way to deal with an unsafe situation. I'm not very equipped to deal with them on my own. And so these cards give me a sense of community and a sense of support. Especially for young college students and for youth, I think these cards are really accessible. It just gives a very easy way to either help someone or to ask for help without having to do much. If everyone has one, then we'll just be able to support each other so much better and feel safer. <laughs> without having to communicate, in other words, because no one knows how what? to communicate. <laughs> what is that going to do? What is that going to do? Yeah, a card. <laughs> oh my God. I just, I, I don't even know sometimes. I'm like, the people in power, I'm like, wow, you, you don't have good ideas. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have good ideas. Feel real good about themselves. I mean, look, though. if you're, let's say, I can see like a narrow circumstance where that might work, or maybe someone's on a date and they're uncomfortable and they have a card and they have a card and they're like, hey, let me find a creative way to slip this to you to let you know that, like, I'm not. First of all, women already have that. It's like. Our spidey sense. We, no, we have the looks we give each other. Like, oh, where it's our like. Our side eyes. <laughs> you know, I don't need a card. I, I can look at you and you'll know if I'm mm -hmm. uncomfortable or need like an intervention situation. But like that's not going to do anything against a, a, a crackhead or a knife or a gun or whatever it is. It's just not. So I, it, it's going to make people feel good, <laughs> makes the influencers. Wait, what? It's literally comical. It, it's insane. And then if you are being attacked or harassed, <laughs> you're going to like be like, wait. Hold on, let me uh, let me just out of my wallet read get my uh, bystander intervention oh, card. You what need should help. I do? Oh yeah, here here it is. It's just the dumbest thing. I just, so dumb. It's just the people. I I think it's that individuals who actually like have good critical thinking skills and good ideas and can can implement and execute and solve problems. They're in the private sector. I think that's Apparently. what it is. They're in the private sector making money, and they're like, I'm not going to work for the government. And so then everybody else who can't do those things is left working for the government. Mm -hmm. that makes uh, sense. All right. Uh, now we're going to go all the way to Scotland where I, it, you know, reading stories about Scotland, I'm like, God bless the constitution. Not that our elected leaders don't try to erode it all the time, but I'm like, thank God for the first amendment. Not so much in Scotland. So Scotland has been trying to strengthen and strengthen is a really loose term. Uh, it's hate crime laws. So they have a new hate crime law that just went into statute. This is from uh, The Independent. The Hate Crime and Public Order Act has been introduced to work alongside existing hate crime laws and has introduced a new offense, quote, threatening or abusive behavior, which is intended to stir up hatred. The protected characteristics include age, disability, religion, sexual orientation, transgender identity, and variations in sex characteristics. So as I'm about to read here, some people who are very critical of this say, are you going to use this to criminalize misgendering people? So it says many speaking out against the new law hold gender critical views, including J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author. Uh, and she has said it would be weaponized against her. Uh, a uh, Scottish member of parliament by the name of Joanna Cherry has previously said being under police investigation could be a punishment in and of itself. Miss Cherry said the law, quote, will be weaponized by trans rights activists to try to silence and worse still, criminalize women who do not share their beliefs. And I have every reason in the world to believe that it'll be implemented in that way and that someone like J.K. Rowling could find herself under criminal investigation for pushing back against the idea that trans women are just the same as biological women. And then it's like almost criminalizing you, forcing you into using the proper preferred gender pronouns for someone because if you don't then what was the quote you could be threatening uh, engaging in threatening or abusive behavior which is intended to stir up hatred who gets to decide whether it's intended to stir up hatred i say a lot of things that m some might deem controversial um but it, it's never intended to stir up hatred so I might hold a view on, you know, transgender surgeries for minors when I just don't think that that's appropriate. And people could say, well, by saying that you're you're intending to stir up hatred, but who gets to make that determination? So this is scary stuff. And honestly, 
it doesn't seem too far-fetched from what has been pushed in Washington state. I mean, the whole, we should talk about it either on the show tomorrow or next week. There was this hate crime bill passed in Olympia. And so they've done some things like, remember when they tried to criminalize election lies? Like just that just oh, yeah. blatant First Amendment issue there. So Scotland, I, I got to say, you know, I, I just don't think that this is going to go over well. Um, not that they have the same protections that we have here, uh, but it's not. This is the other thing to criminalize women who don't share their beliefs. It, and that's it goes back to the story we played yesterday in our, our interview on Sundays with subscribers with Julie Jahman, this 82 year old woman who lost her YMCA membership because she was freaked out that there was a dude in the women's locker room. She's 82 and she's like, hey, do you have a penis? And he's like, yes. And she's like, I'm not comfortable with that. And it's like, that's that's reasonable. It's okay to not be comfortable in a place where you're gonna be naked, showering naked. It's okay to have concerns or questions about why there is a biological man in there. That doesn't make you an evil person. It doesn't mean you are engaging in threatening or abusive behavior, which is intended to stir up hatred. You're sharing your opinion. And honestly, it's a pretty rational opinion that I think reasonable people can have a debate about. There's no room for the gov government involvement and certainly not for police involvement. Okay, we're gonna get to your questions and comments and our daily show poll coming up next. I'm very curious to see if you guys used nuance in your answer to my show poll question. Uh, sometimes you surprise me. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, first, I've been talking to Zach Abraham with Bulwark Capital about what people, especially who are close re to retirement, should be doing right now with their portfolios. I mean, this is a crazy time. We're in this election year, which has a lot of lies being spewed about the economy to make us believe that it's stronger than it is. You've got global unrest. And so if you're close to retirement or in retirement, that's a scary proposition to have your hard-earned retirement exposed to so much risk. And again, Zach says, you know, the market is a really risky place right now. You got the economy expanding at a supposed rate of about 3.2%. You got the government running 7% deficits. If you had if you had normal levels of deficits, 2 to 3% of the economy, you'd be in recession right now. Okay? So the way we look at this generally speaking is I think people are looking at the stock market. I don't think that's what they should be looking at. Um, I think everything's going to continue to go up as long as we're running those deficits. Mm. The key is is that you have to also understand that you're in a falsified environment, meaning these things are not going up because they're worth more. They're going up because effectively the denominator is shrinking. Yeah, and honestly, who can keep track of all of that? I can't. I'm not going to sit there. They've got like people dedicated on staff to look at all these different factors, not just the stock market and all these, you know, unemployment and jobs and all these indicators and precursors to determine where are things actually going. And that's what Zach and his team specialize in is managing risk. Doesn't mean that there's no risk. There's always going to be risk involved, but managing your risk based on where you're at in your retirement journey. So I suggest having a free Know Your Risk Portfolio Review with Zach Abraham, the Chief Investment Officer at Bulwark Capital. He also hosts the Know Your Risk radio podcast. Um, and the uh, risk review is just a good way to see if you're overexposed to risk. There's no obligation. Bulwark doesn't even let you invest with them at your first meeting. So whether you become a client or not, you will leave much more informed about the risk to your retirement. So you only get one retirement. Do not put it at risk needlessly. Schedule your free risk review now at knowyourriskradio.com. That's knowyourriskradio.com. Investment advisory services offered through Trek Financial LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Investments involve risk and are not guaranteed. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All right. I had to ask you guys, this will go into our closing sanity check and it'll be relevant when we get there. Uh, I asked you guys in our daily subscriber show poll, if you were to give Governor Inslee a grade on his leadership of the state over the past 12 years, what grade would you give him? A, B, C, D, or F. Why isn't E a grade? Have you ever asked yourself that question? A, B, C, D, F. <laughs> I've never really investigated that. But that's weird, I've, right? Um, let's Why see. is there no what? E? What? e uh, Why do they leave the E out? Anyway, 82% um, of you on Patreon right now are saying F. Although a couple, a couple people gave them Bs and Cs, which is a surprise. Uh, and then uh, about 16% are saying D. Did you find out why? I did. Why is there no E grade? <laughs> um, back in 1897, the letter E used to mean the same thing as F. Um, however, parents and students found it easier to understand that F stood for failed. Fail. Rather than thinking E could mean excellent. 
<laughs> oh, okay. I can see that. That's fine. I have no issue with that. Uh, let's see. Jeff says, is there something lower than an F? This man wasn't just terrible. He has been dishonest, manipulative, controlling, and condescending, just to name a few of his finer traits. I agree with you on all that. I cannot imagine a worse leader for this state, and I'm praying I don't have to, which is why we have to get Dave elected. True that. Uh, Cap Tom <laughs> says, important management rule. You don't fire people who are hard to replace without knowing how you're going to replace them. Example, Washington State Patrol and ferry workers who need a Coast Guard certificate to work. Very arrogant and or stupid. Could be both. Jay Kui, Jay Kui, Jay Kui says taxes, taxes, taxes will oblivious to real estate problems with public safety, real estate problems with public safety, lack of police, homelessness. Downtown is gross. Never heard of CHOP when it was two days <laughs> in and out of control. Yeah. Uh, Robert says big, fat, bull faced, underlined F. I'm trying to see if there's a comment from someone who gave him a B. I was like, who is, who's in here giving Jay Inslee a B? <laughs> a lot of the commenters are the ones who gave him, gave him an F. Old sub sailor, no comment required. The proof is obvious. Carrie Hedder says, not only bad leadership, but the way he talked to and treated citizens of this state was abhorrent. Plus, he can't manage to answer a question. Would love to see someone compile a before and after list of things like taxes, crime, homelessness, child safety, etc. <laughs> Liz says, in his mind, he did phenomenal. <laughs> and that is true. And we'll get to that coming up next. Uh, some other questions and comments. Uh, let me see here. Matt Gilbert on the We Heart Seattle hit piece. The hit piece they put out on We Heart Seattle had me hanging by a thread. And when I got a push notification saying, did WHS go too far? I was done. Yeah, and I think there was actually some good reporting in there by Sam Campbell that was really in-depth and looked at all these issues. So I don't fault him for the reporting aspect of it, but I think, you know, it's one thing to find dissenting voices, but who are those voices and are you elevating them too high? Are you giving people a platform who ought not have that kind of platform? So I think that's a concern. And then also, does the reporting need to be done? Do we need to dredge up old accusations against Andrea Suarez from nameless, faceless websites or Twitter account accounts just because someone criticized her? We have to do a news story on it. I just disagree. Uh, Mugshot Espresso, I found it shameful that Cairo Radio had Alicia Ramirez on to, sh to sham them in a three-part segment. I agree as well. Uh, Cindy Shoopman, we support Andrea. Is there a way to help and volunteer? Yes, weheartseattle.org. WeHeartSeattle.org is a great way to help and volunteer. Um, Baron of Gray Matter, hey, Brandy, put up a link where we can volunteer with or donate to Andrea. I think it's WeHeartSeattle.org. WeHeartSeattle.org. I want to make sure it's not .com. Yeah, WeHeartSeattle.org. Super simple. Go donate and donate in the name of, like, Alicia Ramirez or something. Andrea Suarez. Uh, volunteer. And volunteer. Oh, and yes. volunteer. Yeah, and volunteer. he was asking. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can volunteer there, too. They have a, a ton of volunteer opportunities. Old Sub Sailor with a $20 super chat. Uh, thank you. Just because I like uh, both your passion for doing the right thing. Uh, keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Uh, on the 18-year-old who killed four people and is going to get out $100,000 bail, Two Ladies Midwest Adventures says the lack of accountability is literally killing people. Please, people, bring back common sense. I agree. Uh, Teresa Lynn Corba says these judges run for office unopposed. It's so bad from the top down. And it's going to take a long time to fix. The judiciary is something that cannot be fixed overnight. It starts with getting a good governor in office who can fill vacancies and make appointments I mean, that's what you see with the presidency. I mean, that's the most important thing that the president does. Not only replaces Supreme Court justices who leave, but also fills the federal courts across the country. Uh, let me see. Denise Young, $20 for the swear char jar. I'm cussing like a sailor today with all this nonsense. Oh, I thought you were saying I swore. I didn't swear. No, she's saying she's swearing. Oh, all right. Denise is holding herself accountable. I love it. Uh, on the Bart cards that you're supposed to pass to someone if you feel unsafe. Mandy says, because I need to hand out instructions on how to act like a human. That's such a good point. It's kind of what you said too, is like, you need a card that tells you what to do if someone tells you that they're uncomfortable. Yeah. It's like, okay. But then also you're expecting them to intervene. Like, you know, you're talking about two young girls here. And it's like, if a, if a girl's being harassed by a guy and is uncomfortable, is that young girl supposed to, what are they supposed to do? Like, what are they supposed to then they're putting themselves in, in jeopardy as well. You might be able to come up with, it's just such a weird card that might work in a one-off random scenario. Why don't we teach people 
like young people like these two girls how to communicate with people and how to problem solve how to kick ass kick ass yeah. how to fight for their their friends fight, fight for themselves i mean it's just ridiculous people don't even know how to operate no. in society anymore no and i did you know the card also allegedly has on some tips to be safer and that's fine. I think that's always good for young people. Oh, like, yeah. hey, here are some tips to make sure that you're, it's like when you're a little kid, it's like, don't talk to strangers. You know, that, yeah. but elevated for teenagers. I think there are some things that teen girls in particular can can learn to try to make sure that they're not as vulnerable out there. Like, look up from your phone. Yeah, look up from your phone. Pay attention take your, to people around take you. Take your earbuds out, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that you, whenever I go into a place, and I think it's just the job, right? Is like I'm always scanning mm -hmm. and then and like Mike when he goes into a place he never sits with his back to the door so I'm always scanning I'm looking at exits so like when I go into a place like I know where my exits and my entrances are and it's automatic and I, so I, I think that's probably just from work and all the crazy stuff that we see over the years but I think that's a good practice for anyone yes. it's like you're you're making you're making eye contact with people and you kind of know what's going on so yep. Yeah, if you want to teach them that, fine. But it's not going to save them from a crazy crackhead on the bard. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, Slow no mo. Slow no mo says you might get better results if you handed out guns. I don't want to hand out guns to random teen girls, but yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't be a bad idea if they learned to defend themselves. Uh, Baron of Grey Matter, I'm buying a million conflict cards and sending them to Scotland. Good idea. Love that. Um. Oh, Dale Draper says, if anyone wants a hat, you better order it now because I'm going to order what's left at about 4 p.m. <laughs> Dale, are you really? Did you get Dale his second order of hats out? I, I think so. I, I hope have to so because I don't want another. received it because I thought he was talking about the first order and so I'm, I'm I don't want another sure. F word thing from, da from he Dale. Sent, he sent a follow up to that saying, I hope you know I was joking. <laughs> I know because he was on the live chat Q&A I did Sunday night with subscribers. And I told him, I said, we knew you we were joking. Although I, I first saw it and I was like, wow, this guy's really mad. We haven't sent out his order yet. <laughs> we send out orders every Thursday. Um, but yeah, so if you want, Nicole, do you have the, uh, before we get to sanity check, our merch thing? Oh, sure. Thanks. If you want some of our merch, we're trying to sell out before we move into our new studio space. And Dale says at 4 p.m. today, he's going to buy out the remainder of the Make Common Sense Great Again hats, which I'm not sure, Dale, that, that might be like 20 that's a it lot. could be. I don't know. But we, hey, we if you want to update our inventory. If you want to buy out the rest of them, like I'm all for that. But uh, go there. And if you're a subscriber, remember you have a top secret promo code. If you don't know it, just message us. But you have a promo code for $5 off. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's get to our closing sanity check because Governor Inslee really just is patting himself on the back. So good news, bad news. Good news, bad news. Governor Inslee has signed his final bill as governor of the state of Washington. Uh, barring some sort of special session situation, that is the last bill he'll sign. And he was nostalgic, I think, in that moment, thinking about all the many bills he signed over his three terms as governor and seeing you know, the waning days uh, of his time in office and just reflecting on really all he's done for the state of Washington. He sent out a tweet saying, the past decade in Washington has been one of significant progress. <laughs> I was going to try to read it without laughing, and it was hard. We've made strides in combating climate change, expanding educational opportunities, and strengthening health care access for all Washingtonians. Governor Inslee, if the past decade in Washington has been one of significant progress, then you and I have a very different definition of the phrase significant progress. That has been our sanity check for today, and that has been today's episode of Undivided. Thank you for being here. Thank you for dealing with my weird personality today. Thank you for standing with me and Nicole and Andrea in the fight for sanity. Because I'll go side by, I'll go to battle side by side with anyone who wants to make this state a better place and wants to take the actions and the steps necessary to actually do it. So I'm glad to have you guys on the side of common sense. UndividedPod.com, if you have not become a subscriber already, we sure would love to have you on Team Sanity. UndividedPod.com, just five bucks a month. See you back here on the live show tomorrow at noon.
hey, are we still on? Who's still here? We're still on. Is this thing on? We had to come back because Matt Gilbert did a super chat. Nicole missed it. You're fired. <laughs> and I was like, Matt was whining, like, why do I even do super chats? Well, we missed a super We've, chat on Thursday I'm as well. I'm sorry, got, Matt. It made the Sunday show. Matt Gilbert with a $10 super chat. He says, let's effing go. Let's effing go. Now the show is actually done. Matt, I'm sorry. Nicole, you're fired. We'll see the rest of you back on the live show tomorrow at noon. Oh, my hair's all weird. My hair's all weird. <laughs> Wow. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye bye for real.